Welcome everyone. I am Bob Wurzelbacher, the director of the Respect Life Office for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. And this is our video podcast series that we call Being Pro-Life. Each month we'll discuss a different topic in the Respect Life arena. We'll hear a personal story from someone deeply affected by that issue, and then we'll share how you can get involved. This month's topic is racism. And today we have several guests. Would you please introduce yourselves? I am Deacon Royce Winters, uh, Director of the Office of African American Ministries for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Derek Montgomery. And I am Dr. Vernisha Montgomery. Emmett Roper, Emmett C. Roper Jr., and I'm a physician at Mercy Health. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carla Isolt, the Hispanic Ministry Coordinator for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. How about we start with the question of what does the church teach about racism? The church teaches through its Catholic social teaching that all people of race, color, uh, language are created in the image of God. And that from that basis that we know that everyone has dignity of life. And the church uses its teaching as its moral authority to call all of the faithful to take a look at how we exercise this dignity of life, respect of life in all aspects of living out faith in the world. Help us to understand what is racism today in this country or what does what does it look like? Because we're not talking about some of the more obvious evils of slavery but we are talking about something nonetheless that is very real and violates the dignity of the human person. So how does it affect us today or what is it today? Glad you asked that. So racism in the 21st century is much more subtle and non-volitional than it was in the 1800s or in the Jim Crow era of 1950s. The issues now are more subconscious and silently ingrained into the fabric of today's culture. It's also a myth that only white people can be racist, and that's not true. People of color can also subconsciously espouse the same prejudices that affect their own people. I agree. I think nowadays racism isn't, oftentimes it's not blatant. It's very subconscious. It's how a person can make you feel. I think that racism is such a bad thing when it puts in people's minds that a person that looks different as a threat. So lately, we, we have been seen as threats, and we have been seen as people that take more than what we can give. And a lot of the Hispanic community, even if they don't have documents, they do pay federal taxes. They don't have to have a social security or documents to get a tax ID, which most of them do. They, you know, pay taxes. So there is a lot more that people need to know about the Hispanic community. So do you have any of your own stories, either of your own or someone else that you'd like to share as examples? When I was in residency, we had nurses that wore scrubs, medical assistants. We even had the janitorial staff wear scrubs. And this one particular night, no different than any other, my other co-residents would go onto the deck, grab a snack, head to the call room. Well, as I was doing that, a receptionist who didn't know me came in and was kind of accusatory. Like, what are you doing here? How can I help you? And I had my badge. I had my stethoscope. I had my white coat. It was an aggressive confrontation. She yeah, she still me. questioned me. And, I, and then finally, I just showed her my badge and I said, I am a resident doctor. And I walked away. And then later on, we, we had a meeting, my attending this particular receptionist, her boss, and it came out that she wasn't sure if I was a janitor because she wanted to protect the medicine cabinet. Why would you assume that I was a janitor? I mean, I have nothing against janitors, you know? I mean, they're working people. But why was that the first assumption made? I mean, we were registering my son for high school at a local high school, and the person who was registering us said that we're not going to offer you the Catholic scholarship because we know that you're not Catholic. Oh my gosh. Not knowing that I was already, I was the director right. of Black American Ministry. Right. My wife's been Catholic all her life. My goodness, you're Black. You so must we, not be Catholic. We had to straighten that one up. Wow. Right. And then for my grandson at a grade school and it was, they were having mass and he went up to receive communion and he made that great throne to receive and the teacher wouldn't give him communion because he could be Catholic because he was a black boy, right? And all those things. Wow. Mm -hmm. He came home and complained and we had to address that. It is those kinds of things that seemingly might be innocent, but it breaks the heart to have to go through that. Right. You would have never asked a white person in those circumstances to do something like that. When I was a third year medical student, 
we used to round with the whole team. Like there were all the residents, now the intern, and then there were fourth year medical students, and then I was at the bottom as, as a third year. So there's about 10 people rounding on each patient. And it happened all the time. But that particular day, my colleague was a young Caucasian girl. He asked her, he said, define cholecystitis. I think it's inflammation of the gallbladder? And she said, yeah. He said, yes. That's great. That's great. <laughs> then he came, and he came to me and he said, I want you to tell me about the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, and how it exits the brain. Go. <laughs> <laughs> So my colleague is asked, what is the inflammation of a bladder? But the thing about it was I actually told him, you know, I, <laughs> I told him where it came from and started the ponds and, you know, it goes around and it exits the stylomastoid foramen. And, you know, everybody was like, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> but that was a daily occurrence. He would ask my colleague something very simple. And then he asked me something extremely hard. And if I didn't get it right, it was kind of a justification yeah. that I needed to study, right? It's justification like, oh, you don't belong here almost. It happens over and over. <laughs> and the culmination of it was the whole rotation, I was answering things that even the residents couldn't answer. But at the end of the day, when it came down to my grade, said I needed to improve my medical knowledge. My sophomore year in high school, I sustained an injury while playing in our homecoming football game. And... After the game, I had x-rays done and I found I had a broken leg. That led me to have to spend the next six weeks with the medical staff. And through that time, I had the opportunity to meet our team doctor. During that time, he asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And for the first time in my life, I told him that I wanted to be a physician. And he was actually the first person that I had had that discussion with. So why is it that you hadn't had that discussion with anybody else before? I think maybe because I had said something when I was in junior high and, and they made fun of me. I had counselors who would tell me that you might as well not try to go to college and not college material. You'd be better off learning a trade when there was clear evidence that there were other things that I could do that were on a higher level as a physician. And so I was afraid to share my story. The doctor that uh, encouraged me, he asked me basically what my course load was and what I had been doing. And, and he gave me some advice as to what I needed to do if I really wanted to do it. So I changed the projection of my course load in school. I was told that I didn't have a background to do those things, but I figured that if I was ever going to make it, I had to get past the negative advice that I got to not do it and just try it. I had nothing to lose. We like to work in our yard and we ran out of mulch. So I went to the store and walking out with maybe 20 to 25 bags of mulch, this worker came to me and said, if you wait, I will help you load your car. And he was helping another gentleman taking his stuff to his car. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. I got it. And, and I kept walking. And the older gentleman tell the worker, don't worry. That's what they do for the living. And he was not kidding. But I'm a middle class woman living in Mason, Ohio. They have a nice car, a nice house. And I cannot even imagine what poor Latino people that hardly speak the language, what they get told that they don't even understand and, or how they're being treated. And, and, you know, it was just in the parking lot of a store. And I felt like, you know, even if I did mulch for the living, that's a job. And the dignity of the person needs to be respected. What can people do to have an intentional effort to combat racism and the history of racism and as it affects society today? If it's not enough to just say, okay, now we're just going to start treating everybody fairly and the same, then what can we do to, to help yeah for those folks who are Catholics. So you go to a different church where the worship services are different or exchanging choirs or even leadership for a mass so that there is an understanding of how other people worship and live their lives. I think we tend to vote in the context of things that affect us as individuals. And what we really probably should be say, okay, how is my vote going to impact other people? We rarely interact like we need to within our society so that we can better understand how people think, what they do, what they like, what they don't like. I think starting and doing those kind of things are, are some of the things that we can do.
you know, have a constant dialogue with your children about the state of affairs that's happening in the world and how to look at people as people. This goes for African Americans, white people, Asian, anybody, you know, because we can all harbor racist ideas or stereotypes or prejudices. This is a great dialogue to have. Sometimes the white privileges is they're not necessarily forced to live outside of your comfort zone, which is maybe your your white church, your white school or whatever that is, you know, and, you know, and you encounter singular black people or Hispanic people or Asian people in those particular things. And you, you don't necessarily have to deal with them on a, on a regular basis. Okay. You're not going to understand the other person's culture unless you know them mm -hmm. outside of a cursory, hey, how you doing? What's the weather? You know, it, does, it may be in a intramural league. It may be at church yeah. and that's the thing it takes more effort i mean someone who is actively interested in that you know there are certain volunteer opportunities like as soup kitchens where you're serving a group less fortunate but you are getting some diversity so it's just like actively finding things if there is someone different you know in your child's class you're encouraging them to sit with them for lunch and talk have about it day. have have, have a play date, date you know Please, if you see any Latinos in your churches or in your neighborhood, reach out. Go out a little of your comfort zone and introduce yourself to somebody in, in your neighborhood. If you know a neighbor, invite them over for dinner. And we love cooking too. So have a supper. We'll be happy to cook something and bring it over. If you go to church and, and you see programs, try to talk to the parents when they are dropping their children off. Invite them over to, hey, I'm taking a Bible study class. Why don't you join us? Sometimes we need that little extra push to feel welcome, to feel like we're accepted. Sometimes, especially at our parishes, the Latino community feel like we're sharing a space or like we are borrowing a space, not like we belong there. So please make them feel that like we do belong because the place that we feel the safest is at church. What everyone's saying reminds me of a story that I think I'll share my wife works with children and we're talking about nine-year-olds and their assignment was to put together a prayer service choose the music and choose the intentions and choose the readings and they chose the reading from Acts of the Apostles where the Holy Spirit came down and everyone spoke in the different languages of the people and, and there was a child in the class that was not well known he was very shy and quiet and people didn't really hardly knew he was there and through talking about this reading they find out that he speaks Vietnamese and prays Vietnamese in his home Mm -hmm. And so then he was invited to pray the Our Father in Vietnamese as part of that prayer service. And he did that. And my wife was saying that you should have been in the room with the way they were attentive and excited and just watching the Holy Spirit like move young people's hearts, listening to, wow, we all know the Our Father, but the language is so different here. Anyway, yeah. when they invited him to do it again mm -hmm. a second time. And it, then it totally changed the relationship in the classroom. We too often, whether it be our workplaces or whether it be in our homes, our neighborhoods, and our communities, we, we treat to our own spaces where our spaces look just like us. And if that's the case, it means that we have to be proactive in seeking opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one conversation to embrace the other that looks different than me. And, 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 and somehow we find difficulty in doing that. I know, for example, we had a busy weekend and we found an evening mass on a Sunday at a primarily African-American church community. And so that's where we went. And very young children at the time, I think they were two and five or something like that. And that experience was just so different from what we were accustomed to. And we commonly would ask them after church, what stood out to you or what did you hear today or that kind of thing. And the five-year-old said, the priest was really happy. I mean, that was... That was the way she put it. I would say the attitude was just come from a more joyful and emotional spirit. It was, it was noticeably different. And the whole community seemed noticeably different in their attitudes towards us. The way they did the sign of peace. They didn't just turn to the person six inches away from them. I mean, they were walking the aisles and everybody came to welcome us. And the yeah. children mentioned that specifically as well. I bring that up because it was a great experience they still remember. And you can learn how different communities worship when you, when you do that kind of a thing.
And a lot of parishes are having maybe once a month or every other Sunday a Spanish mass. So the other weekends, we can go to an English mass and get more involved in the parish life, not just separate ourselves, Hispanic community and the Anglo community, etc. So Spanish masses are really important. However, you know, I love going to my parish and it's an English mass and they are playing bilingual songs. I feel home. I'm like, oh my God, they're singing in Spanish. So I encourage not just the Spanish, but see what your community is and try to mix it, try to do maybe a reading here and there that in the native language, they will feel so welcome. And it's just a feeling of belonging. And I think that's really important. So how is the Archdiocese helping people? One of the things that the church is, ahead, is, is going to host March 8th is a listening session where the USCCB, the United States of Catholic Bishops, recently wrote a pastoral letter. And in that letter, they've had opportunities to listen to people who have been impacted by racism. And the next one is going to be at University of Dayton. The bishop who is the co-chair of the Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism for the U.S. Catholic Bishops is uh, Bishop Shelton Farb, and he will be present with Dennis Snoor and Joseph Benzer and other bishops who are going to come in and listen to our people as we express how racism has impacted, but also our ability to rejoice and give thanks for God who is journeying with us to lead us toward better pastures. I'm showing the flyer on the screen right now for everybody to see. It's called Race and Justice in America. It's a free event on Friday, March 8th from 3 to 5 p.m. It says here to register, email you, rwinters at catholiccincinnati.org. Yes, and we hope everybody take advantage of this opportunity to come, to be present, but also to listen to the voices and to worship and to pray. Another event that we're hosting on March 30th, in these United States, we've yet to have an African-American canonized as a saint. And it's so fortunate for us that in this time, in this 21st century, we have six African-Americans who are being considered as in the cause of be canonized as saints. So on March 30th at St. Joseph University, we're going to host a reflection day to reflect on the lives of these saints who suffered, but yet were able to hear the voice of God and called to holiness, and they responded. I'm now showing that flyer on the screen as well. It says here, like, like you said, that's March 30th, 2019. March 30th is a Saturday, so it's all day from 9.30 to 4 p.m., also free. And then you also register by contacting you, rwinters at catholiccincinnati.org, or your number, 513-421-3131. Your extension is 26. Is there a deadline for registration for either one of these events? The deadline is probably a week before the event. They're free events, and we want to give everybody an opportunity to respond and to attend. Okay, great. Well, we don't have a whole lot of time then for the race and justice in America if you've just heard about it, but hopefully you can still contact Deacon Royce and see if we can be there. Terrific. One, one of the things I want to share, and yeah. it's really about my own life, is this faith that's embedded in us didn't begin with us. I share that because we recognize that the harsh America that my grandparents lived in, because of them and people like them, I don't have to live through that same harshness, but it's still there. I can remember when I first became a police officer, my mother said to me, baby, you can't be a police officer. Police officers don't like black people, right? From her experience of growing up down south of the brutal law enforcement that she had encountered. And even though we moved from there to Cincinnati and she never had encountered that kind of brutality within law enforcement, it was embedded in her. That's what she knew. So we know that our past affects and impacts how we see the present. And we have to find new ways to allow our children to see differently. And we can only do that by being advocates of doing justice and living justice today and doing it the best that we know how. Well, thank you, everyone, for sharing with us today on our Being Pro Life video. Let's hope that we can continue to move forward and being aware of different cultures. I hope we can aware of this church is a whole lot bigger than the neighborhood or the community that we live in. And hopefully we can participate in these conversations March 8th and, and elsewhere that we can better understand each other, hear about each other, and move forward in improving our ability to love one another as Christ does. Thank you for your time. I commend you for doing this. I really think this is... Mm -hmm. This is helpful.
you know, this is a this is a great start for you know to bridge that gap. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, this has been helpful. Thank you so much for having me and for doing this. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. And uh, have a great day.